So welcome to Transatlantic Poetry on Air. My name is Robert Peek, creator of the series. And tonight's evening is hosted by Jennifer Williams of the Scottish Poetry Library. And Jennifer joins us this evening from the library in Edinburgh. Jennifer? Hi. Uh, this is Jennifer Williams at the Scottish Poetry Library. Thank you so much, Robert. It's really exciting to be here, and this is an event we've been talking about and looking forward to for months now, so it's fabulous that it's actually happening. Uh, we are really lucky this evening to be joined by two poets, uh, but both separated by many thousands of miles and an ocean, and that's one of the joys of this technology. Uh, when we were first talking about doing this event, we'd been thinking for a long time about trying to do some events which uh, allowed us to um, to contact, to bring people and poets together who were spread around the world, and this feels like a real opportunity to do that, so that's super exciting. The poets that we have with us, uh, well, this afternoon and this evening, depending on where you might be in the world, are uh, the poet uh, John Glende, who's in Scotland, but not in the same part of Scotland that we're in, and the poet Dorian Locks, who is in America. And I'm going to introduce Dorian first, because she's going to be reading first for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then when she's finished, we'll have uh, John uh, read for us. Um, let's see. So Dorian, uh, we have her reading in part because John and Dorian met at the Aldborough Festival and got on, and so we're really delighted to uh, to have had her be able to join us this evening. Dorian is the recipient of numerous prizes, including three Best American Poetry Prizes, a Pushcart Prize, two fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh, which is very good, and she's also been widely anthologized. She's read at the Library of Congress, directs the Creative Writing Program at North Carolina State University, and recent books include Facts About the Moon, The Book of Men, um, which is beautiful, and I've got here, we were just talking about the amazing cover, and The Book of Women. Her poetry goes to the heart of human experience, and to quote uh, the back of The Book of Men, is a love song to the imperfections that unite and divide us. And Dorian herself has said, craft is important, a skill to be learned, but it's not the beginning and end of the story. I want the muddled middle to be filled with the gristle of living. And I think when you hear her poems, you'll get a sense of that, uh, the joy and the gristle as well. So I'll hand us over, first of all, to Dorian Locke. Hello, this is Dorianne. Can you hear me, everyone? Um, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, start reading, I guess. Um, I can't, I can't hear you, but I guess that's okay. Um, we can hear you fine, hello. We can hear you fine. <laughs> great, great. Great. Um, I was going to start with a poem that um, Jennifer had mentioned. Um, in something that I read, uh, which is from my uh, book, What We Carry, and it's called Dust. Someone spoke to me last night, told me the truth, just a few words, but I recognized it. I knew I should make myself get up, write it down, but it was late, and I was exhausted from working all day in the garden, moving rocks. Now, I remember only the flavor, not like food, sweet or sharp, more like a fine powder, like dust. And I wasn't elated or frightened, but simply wrapped, aware. That's how it is sometimes. God comes to your window, all bright lights and black wings, and you're just too tired to open it. <coughs> And uh, Jennifer also mentioned another poem from Smoke, uh, which is called Family Stories. Um, I had a boyfriend who told me stories about his family. 
How an argument once ended when his father seized a lit birthday cake in both hands and hurled it out a second story window. That, I thought, was what a normal family was like. Anger sent out across the sill, landing like a gift to decorate the sidewalk below. In mine, it was fists and direct hits to the solar plexus, and nobody ever forgave anyone. But I believed the people in his stories really loved one another, even when they yelled and shoved their feet through cabinet doors or held a chair like a bottle of champagne, christening the wall, rungs exploding from their holes. I said it sounded harmless, the pomp and fury of the passionate. He said it was a curse, being born Italian and Catholic. And when he looked from that window, what he saw was the moment rudely crushed. But all I could see was a gorgeous three-layer cake gliding like a battered ship down the sidewalk, the smoking candles broken, sunk deep in the icing, a few still burning. <clears throat> and um, this is a, a poem from the Book of, uh, the Book of Men, and it's uh, the title poem in a way uh, for the book, and it's written in somewhat of a form, a little form that I made up, um, and it's a form in which the final word of the line ends in the F sound, and uh, the F sound could be, of course, a, a regular F or two Fs, or it could be the GH sound. Um, the problem is that once I started using that sound for the poem, I couldn't stop using it. So actually it's all through the poem, but also at the ends of the line. And this is called Men. It's tough being a guy, having to be gruff and buff, the strong, silent type, having to laugh it off, pain, loss, sorrow, betrayal, or leave in a huff and say, no big deal, take a ride. Listen to enough loud rock and roll that it scours out your head, if not your heart. Or to be called a fag or a poof when you love something or someone, scuffing a shoe across the floor, hiding a smile in a muffler pulled up nose high, an eyebrow raised for the word quaff used in casual conversation, wine, air, an oil change at the jiffy lube, gulping it down. A joke no one gets. It's rough, yes, the tie around the neck, the starch white cuffs too long, too short, frayed, frilled, rolled up. The self isn't an easy quest for a beast with balls, a cock, proof of something difficult to define or defend. Chief or chef, thief or roofer, serf or sheriff, Feet on the earth or aloof, son, brother, husband, lover, father. They are different from us, except when they fall or stand alone on a wharf. <coughs> so <coughs> once I finished writing The Book of Men, um, which are poems about men from um, all walks of life, some that I know, some that um, I didn't know. Um, uh, strangers, um, there are monks, there are uh, Mick Jaggers in there, um, uh, a man's at an airport getting ready to ship off to Afghanistan. And um, once I wrote it, I decided that I need to also write uh, a book of women. And so uh, I ended up with a little chat book called The Book of Women. and. Um, in there is uh, Dolly Parton, because who could be more of a woman than Dolly Parton? And this is a poem for her, and it's called Dolly's Breasts. Dolly's breasts are singing from the rafters of her chest, swaying beneath sheeny satin, suspended in the choreography of her bra. Twin albino dolphins breaching from her ball gown's rhinestone cleavage. Her breasts are sisters, praying at twilight, a pair of fat-cheeked Baptists dreaming of peaches, her nipples the color of autumn, 
too lonely amber eyes. When she shakes her metallic bodice, tinsel swimming up her pink fonts of nourishment, the spotlight hums and shimmies with them, the audience open-mouthed, stunned into silence as she crosses her legs and bows, her hair hanging down, a permed curl caught in that soft, improbable seam. So that's for Dolly. In the Book of Men, actually, there's a uh, poem for Cher. And so I felt that if I was going to write a poem for Cher, I should also write one for Dolly. Um, and this uh, final poem is from um, Facts About the Moon. And uh, it's the last poem in the first sec, or there's a small poem in the first section called Moon in the Window. And um, it's, it's uh, a little preface, sort of, to Facts About the Moon. Moon in the Window. I wish I could say I was the kind of child who watched the moon from her window, would turn toward it and wonder. I never wondered. I read. Dark signs that crawled toward the edge of the page. It took me years to grow a heart from paper and glue. All I had was a flashlight, bright as the moon, a white hole blazing beneath the sheets. And this is Facts About the Moon. All these facts are true facts about the moon that I discovered myself one night when I was watching the Discovery Channel. Facts About the Moon. The moon is backing away from us an inch and a half each year. That means if you're like me and were born around 50 years ago, the moon was a full six feet closer to the earth. What's a person supposed to do? I feel the gray cloud of consternation travel across my face. I begin thinking about the moon lit past. How if you go back far enough, you can imagine the breathtaking hugeness of the moon. Prehistoric solar eclipses, when the moon covered the sun so completely, there was no corona only a darkness we had no word for. And future eclipses will look like this, the moon, a small black pupil in the eye of the sun. But these are bald facts. What bothers me most is that someday the moon will spiral right out of orbit and all land-based life will die. The moon keeps the oceans from swallowing the shores keeps the electromagnetic fields in check at the polar ends of the earth. And please don't tell me what I already know, that it won't happen for a long time. I don't care. I'm afraid of what will happen to the moon. Forget us. We don't deserve the moon. Maybe we once did, but not now, after all we've done. These nights, I harbor a secret pity for the moon, rolling around alone in space without her milky planet, her only love, a mother who's lost a child, a bad child, a greedy child, or maybe a grown boy who's murdered and raped. A mother can't help it. She loves that boy anyway, and in spite of herself, she misses him. And if you sit beside her on the padded hospital bench outside the door to his room, you can't not take her hand. Listen to her while she weeps, telling you how sweet he was, how blue his eyes. And you know she's only romanticizing, that she's conveniently forgotten the bruises and boos, the stolen car, the day he ripped the phones from the walls and you want to slap her back to sanity, remind her of the truth. He was a leech, a fuck-up, a little shit, and you almost do, until she lifts her pale, puffy face, her eyes to craters, and then you can't help it either. You know love when you see it. You can feel its lunar strength, its brutal pull. Thank you. <laughs> so.
So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and I know this is live, and I know that um, uh, sometimes problems occur, and uh, I'm not sure if anybody even heard that whole reading. And yeah, so, we loved it. Thank you. <laughs> I think it was wonderful. We're back over to uh, over to you, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Should I mute myself? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Jennifer, we're over to you. Right, well... As you know, <laughs> the next part of the program is uh, John Glenn Day. Um, I don't uh, have a biog for him in front of me, but I've been reading Green with great interest um, and, and loving his work. Um, so it's a pleasure for me to, um, to ask him to carry on with the reading. John, you ready? I think I, I think I'm more ready than Jennifer is in Edinburgh. Anyway, Robert, yes, we'll, we'll get her back um, on there. I think that is the the report that needs no introduction. That's what it should say, actually, shouldn't it? <laughs> Concise, anyway. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Such a pleasure listening to Dorian there, um, and it's I think a great initiative to share readings across the Atlantic like this. Um, I, I particularly loved the dust poem because it reminded me of. I suppose it reminded me about how bloody difficult writing is. And here's Jennifer now. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we lost you there for a minute. Uh, oh, we lost you. Oh, uh, um, is it still useful for me to introduce you, John? Yes, go on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, what I was trying to say when we weren't working, obviously, was uh, how amazing it was to get to hear Dorian read her extraordinary poems. Thank you so much, Dorian. It's very moving and beautiful to hear them in your own voice. Uh, and uh, how excited we are to have John Glenday now. John, uh, who's reading to us from his home in the Scottish Highlands. Uh, and whose poems, perhaps in a way not dissimilar to Dorian's, find the transcendence in the everyday and are celebrated for their respect of the majesty of silence and the poignancy of that which often goes unnoticed in everyday life. Uh, his books have been recommended um, by the Poetry Book Society and have been shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Award and the Griffin International uh, Poetry Prize. The Apple Ghost, uh, his first book, and Undark, his second book, which we've got here, uh, were earlier books, and Grain is his most recent, and he's working toward a new collection, as well as keeping busy with translating work by Iraqi and Palestinian poets, and uh, a quote of John's that we quite liked was, a lot of people do want to be poets when they're young, but I never grew out of it. So now we've got some poems from the fabulous John Glende. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm indeed I'm in the uh, the heart of the Scottish Highlands in my writing cupboard, um, and I apologise for all the 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 muddle behind me. It reminded me of Dorian's muddled middle. You know, I think I'm writing from that. I actually sometimes think that a, a writer's study is uh, is a manifestation of the insides of their consciousness. You know, so this is a muddled inside. Anyway, I'm going to start with two poems about jewels. Uh, and the first one is the pearl. It's taken from um, a quote from Tac Tacitus's Agricola. Um, Tacitus was writing about the life of his uh, and the campaigns of his father-in-law Agricola. And basically he's bitching about the British weather, which is pretty dour. It's grey, it's constantly raining, it's cold, he doesn't want to be there. Um, and he happens to mention that one good thing about Britain is that it produces pearls, but they're also pretty dull. And I love that, how everything in Britain is dull. But of course, in all my poetry, um, they're never about what they seem to be about. British pearls. And I'll start off with a quote from Tacitus, badly pronounced probably. 
Gignit et Oceanus Margarita sed subfusca ac leventia. And he's basically saying they do produce pearls, but they're discoloured and dull. British pearls. British pearls are exceptionally poor. They can be gathered by the handful wherever surf breaks, but you'll find no colour, no vitality, no lustre to them. Every last one stained the roughshod grey of their drab, unmediterranean weather. Imagine all the rains of this island held in one sad, small, turbulent world. I can hear them falling as I write. British pearls are commonplace and waterish and dull, but their women wear them as proudly as we wear gold. And my second piece of jewellery is... John, can I yeah. talk to you for a second? We can't see you. Oh, you can't see me. Your video on. Yes. Huh, okay. Well, <laughs> I just thought we'd double check. That was stunning. It sounds beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> can anyone else see me? I wonder. I wonder if Robert can see me. I'm not sure. We were just chatting and he's... Not yet. Uh, sometimes it, it'll go to an image of you if the broadband on your side is low. So... Right. Um, as long as your video is unmuted, it's not red, then uh, carry on. No, it's and okay. Hope it kicks yeah. in and we can see you in, in the flesh in a minute here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's fabulous. It, Keep going. <laughs> it's, it's probably better seeing me this way, to be honest. My, my second um, jewel is amber. And it's interesting that both pearls and amber are really responses by an organism to damage, to hurt. So the, the pearl is formed around a grain of sand, usually inside the oil. And amber is the uh, response of a tree to injury. So it produces resin, um, which seals that injury, if you like. And of course, the most expensive amber is the amber that had inclusions. And inclusions were usually insects that were, were caught in the amber and held there and preserved perfectly. Um, there's a reference in the poem to the um, amber room in the Catherine Palace uh, outside St. Petersburg, and it, it was made from six tons of amber that, that completely lined the walls. Amber. Some wounds weep precious through the generations. They heal themselves into history by growing sticky, then hard. What was mere sap once matures like blood in water to duskin and burnish and change into something useful, almost. The Tsar had a whole room built from heart, but it was stolen and buried. Sometimes the grim Baltic rolls the scars to shape those hapless jewels women like to wear, especially treasured where they hold a thing that was living then, something with quick venated wings which happened by and thought the wound looked beautiful and sweet and that, like other wounds, it should be acknowledged somehow, lingered over and, if only for a moment, touched. I often write about spiritual things, spiritual, although I, I feel, strangely enough, I'm, I'm basically not a, a spiritual person. It's something I'm investigating constantly in my life. And this next poem is taken from uh, a depiction of the flight into Egypt. Um, and it was a, an azulejo, which is uh, tin glazed tiles, which in Portugal were used to portray often religious scenes in churches. And, and they, had a, they had a practical purpose as well. The, these large uh, tiled um, paintings were, were like a form of air conditioning, really. They, they were used to keep the temperature down. But I loved the, the juxtaposition of the religious topic, the flight into Egypt, with Tin, with tiles, kitchen tiles, if, if you like, and it made 
the Bible seem domestic, which, uh, which appealed to me greatly. So this is the flight into Egypt after Polycarpo de Olivero Bernardish. Like so much of the Bible, it's all predictably domestic. Just a family on its way somewhere, skirting a thread of towns. Everything is figments of blue because they are in history. No one is brave enough to look ahead. Joseph glowers at the chafing calf boots he bartered for in Bethlehem. Mary pretends to doze, her fingers locked around the swaddle. Even their guardian angel is glancing back. His know-all smile encompasses the dusty road, Judea diminishing, and the almost newborn who is staring complacently over our right shoulders into today. Only the old donkey holds his gaze fixed on Egypt, head down, ears back, grudging a burden that is worth so little and a tiresome journey he knows has barely begun. Um, I'm a bit like Leonard Cohen and Gerard Tolkien in that I feel I've got no real imagination. Well, that's a bit untrue because uh, Tolkien was accused of having no imagination, but it was Leonard Cohen that said he felt that his lack of imagination was his strength. He was like a, a vacuum, and because it wasn't there, it drew experience into itself. And I like that idea of having to look at the world to find out what we're thinking about ourselves. And it's probably because I'm a bit of an optimist, but I think the world is constantly trying to tell us what it's all about. Um, and I often use painting to begin a poem. I don't write about paintings. Um, I don't write about images. They're simply ways of beginning to write, because as you know, Poems don't begin with ideas, they begin with words. So this poem begins with Edward Mybridge's photograph of the steamer Golden City in dry dock in San Francisco. And none of that's in the poem. The steamer Golden City. Far from the sea, you still feel part of it. All those dull, impatient lights, that reckless hush. But the way the morning breaks against itself marks progress of a sort, like a prow digging under, ploughing the hours white. Even on land, even right here at home, you find yourself stalled by the sense of something you cannot see, dividing and falling away behind. And you wish it could be real, that wake trailing back beyond ocean or purpose. Something to prove to anyone who cared notice that for a time, if only a moment, you were going somewhere. And I'll read a couple of poems to finish off with from uh, three poems from, from my last book, from, from Grain. Um, and the first one's another ekphrastic poem. It's based on a, on a Julian Opie painting, which I, I don't really need to talk about, because as I said, the, the, the poem begins at the painting and goes off in somewhere on its own. Um, and the, the, the painting's one of a, a fairly empty roadscape, and the poem's really about travelling in a, in a spiritual sense. And it's a poem that I've always enjoyed reading, but uh, the last time I read it, I found it deeply uncomfortable. And it was uh, when I was in uh, Iraq at the beginning of last year, and I read this at a festival. And in Arabic poetry, is very close to music, and it's not uncommon for music to accompany a poetry reading. And so I didn't know this, but um, when I began writing this, uh, reading this poem out loud at that reading, 
the band in the background began to play the theme music to Titanic, which I found deeply unnerving, as if they were trying to say something to me about my poor brain. You know, it was going down with an iceberg. Anyway, this is Imagine You're Driving. Imagine you're driving nowhere, with no one beside you, with the empty road unravelling and ravelling in sympathy as the wheel turns in your hands. On either side, the wheat fields go shimmering past in an absence of birdsong, and the sky decants the shadows of the weather from itself. So you drive on, hopeful of a time when the ocean will rise up before you like dusk, and you will make landfall at last, some ancient, long-forgotten mooring which both of you, of course, will recognise. Though, as I said before, there is no one beside you, and neither of you has anywhere to go. And I suppose this poem, my second last, is also, in a way, ecrastic. It, it's based on an, uh, an etching by a friend of mine, Bill Duncan. And he was explaining the process of making an etching, how you start with a bare surface and use various tools to incise the images into that outline, into that surface. And it's only where you have incised those lines, where you've made that picture, like carving out the carving out the images that the ink sticks and the print will make. And I love that paradox that somehow it's only the things that we let go of that we can really hold on to. And so writing about that process, about the process of making the etching, reminded me of the death of my father, and it became an elegy for my father, this poem. And it was coincidental almost that the the image in Bill Duncan's etching was of a landscape where I went many times with my father and where we used to walk. Um, and he was a very, very quiet, private person. And somehow the bareness of the etching seemed to suit him perfectly. Etching of a line of trees in memoriam John Goodfellow Glendy. I carved out the careful absence of a hill, and a hill grew. I cut away the fabric of the trees, and the trees stood shivering in the darkness. When I had burned off the last syllables of wind, a fresh wind rose and lingered. But because I could not bring myself to remove you from that hill, you are no longer there. How Wonderful it is that neither of us managed to survive when it was love that surely pulled the bar and love that gnawed its own shape from the burnished air and love that shaped that absent wind against a tree. Some shadow's hands moved with my hands and everything I touched was turned to darkness and everything I could not touch was light. I've always been fascinated with the human interest in fairy tale and after thinking about it a lot I came to the conclusion, which is probably completely wrong, that the reason we are attracted to fairy tale is because it's like the real world but it's not the real world. It's the real world played backwards. Um, and, that, and that can sound a bit strange, but if you imagine that in, in the real world, at least in my world, we start off from a relatively free and happy beginnings. And as we grow, the, the shutters begin to close around us, our opportunities grow more constricted, we have more weight of responsibility on our shoulders, and things get gradually more difficult. Um, whereas in the fairy tale, things tend to start off difficult and through some magical process 
all these shackles are cast aside and they get on with their lives and live happily ever after. You know, you have Jack who starts off selling the family cow for a handful of, of beans and it ends up with fistfuls of gold or um, Snow White um, poisoned by the apple. And in the fairy tale, the difficulties become at the beginning. In the real life, the difficulties are waiting for us. And this sounds hopelessly pessimistic, but it's not really. I tested out my theory by rewriting Beauty and the Beast backwards. And so that's basically what this poem is. It's Walt Disney's Beauty and the Beast from end to beginning. A fairy tale. She had been living happily ever before, waltzing through imagined ballrooms in the arms of a handsome young prince. Then, one day, they kiss for the first time. He takes back the word love and suddenly bloats to an idle, wounded beast that stoops above her in its thickening hide. She trembles before his laboured breath and white, strange eyes. Each night, from her solitary bed, she overhears the echoes of unimaginable rages which transform their castle to a ruin of shadowy rooms with a cursed and sleeping heart. At last she understands him poorly enough to be terrified and run a gauntlet of scattering wolves to the arms of her sick father, who greets her with a tearful goodbye. They subsist forever after on a diet of simple gruel and vague desire. When passers-by ask her about her life, she waltzes the laundry to her heart and answers with a distant smile, once upon a time. Thank you very much. I'll pass you back to Robert in London. Or to me. <laughs> or to you, Jennifer. Uh, I think I, I or end to Robert. <laughs> um, thank you so much, John. That's amazing. Oh, what a haunting poem. I just um, I just watched a wonderful film called Blanca Nieve last night. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but it was a beautiful inter Spanish interpretation of Snow White, and it, it ended with a tear, so it didn't have your typical happy ending ah. either. <laughs> But it's very beautiful, like your poem. Uh, thank you so much. I'm now going to sh uh, ask the poets some questions and share some of our audience's questions with uh, both Dorian and John for uh, for them to answer. Um, and I was just going to remind anyone who's watching and listening that you should have a little uh, Q and A. Um, place where you can click on below your screen if you do want to add in any questions, feel free. Um, John, I'll just start maybe with a question from myself because I was fascinated by something you said, poems don't begin with ideas, they begin with words. Uh, what do you mean? That's very interesting. <laughs> I, I'm surprised, Jennifer. I thought it was so obvious that they're made, that they're made from words, that they begin with words. Um, I, suppose what I'm, I suppose what I'm meaning is I'm very wary of the poem being driven by an idea because I may be quite different from other people, but my initial ideas, when I have a, a great idea for a poem, they tend to be cliched and they tend to be obvious and they tend to have a degree of superficiality that doesn't suit the poem at all. Whereas I begin the poem almost not knowing where I'm going, then the process of redrafting and working on that poem is also a process of finding out what I'm saying. And often at the beginning there is some vague idea that uh, I, I, I know what this should be about, but that develops, if, it, if it's a vagueness, then it develops into a, a proper idea as the poem develops. And I find that the idea then has much more substance. That's so uh, absolutely fascinating. I think it's a really good point. Uh, Dorian, do you have any feelings about that? Have we got Dorian? Am I here? Here you are. Mm. <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah. 
Yeah, hello. Um, that was a fabulous reading. Um, I really, really enjoyed listening to every single one of those poems. Um, and absolutely, I mean, when we begin to write, we may have some vague notion of something that we want to write about, but the poem sort of, the, the language of the poem itself is what leads us, you know, um, not, the, not the idea. It's the sound, it's the rhythm, it's the images. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I'm in, in full agreement with that. And um, and you had said uh, again about that one particular poem you read specifically, but you know that sound, the sounds of the words had really had an effect on uh, your shaping of that poem. Do do you find that a lot that um, that the as the words are coming out and as those sounds are coming out, it actually pushes you in one direction or another? Absolutely. I mean, I had the vague notion that I wanted to write about men and I had a lot of ideas about men but I didn't know what the poem was going to tell me that I wanted to say about men um, until I wrote it following the sounds um, of the poem which led me to say things that I would not have said otherwise if you had asked me the question what do you think of of men what do you th how, how do you feel for instance that they're different from us um, you know that that question only came at the end of the poem after I had already you know, discovered all these things um, about men. So it was the sound, yeah. Yeah. Sorry if I can come in, Jennifer. Of course. Um, I, I was fascinated with what Dorian was saying about form, you know, and I think you know, I've, I've seen this, you, you've written about this before, how important form is to, to the poem. And to me, the idea is mediated by the form. So our ideas have to change because they have to conform to the, the restrictions that the, the form of the poem is putting on us. And I, I love that idea. I think restrictions open us out. They give us so many new possibilities. We have to change our, our course because we're conforming to the, to the strictures of the poem. It's wonderful because it makes of the act of writing, uh, it makes the act of writing the poem, the poem itself begins to have a kind of effect on us as people when we're writing poems. Mm -hmm. Fa fabulous idea. Uh, let's bring in some questions from the audience. I don't want to hog you to myself all evening. Um, we've got a, a question from Fiona Benson in England. She's asking specifically to hear a little bit from Dorian about the genesis and writing of her extraordinary poem, Facts About the Moon, which is great because we got to hear that poem. Dorian, could you tell us a little bit more about that? It's a really interesting mix of kind of starts out very feeling very scientific and precise and then um, remains very precise but becomes so potent and emotional. Yeah, here's another great example, John, of a, of a poem that began with my kind of obsession and fascination with the moon and these certain facts about it that uh, I found amazing and just kind of wanted to write down um, and find some form for. Uh, I have no idea how the leap in the poem occurred from going to these simple facts to suddenly um, a mother in a waiting room in a hospital. Um, when I look back on the poem after, you know, a very long time of looking at it and working with it and re uh, revising it, I suddenly realized that really probably that that child in the waiting room was my sister and that that mother was my mother. Uh, but I didn't realize that at the time. These were two people that came to me in the writing of the poem and it was only later that I realized I was probably working some family business out, you know, uh, in the poem. Um, and uh, that, uh, how I was led to that, I think all poets will tell you that in the passion of writing, that things happen that they cannot replicate in after the poem is written. They don't know where it came from, how it happened, and that's the best of what can happen when you're writing, that uh, you're surprised yourself at where the poem wants to go. Mm -hmm. um, and you, f you even forget how it was constructed. It's as if you were in a dream and uh, the poem just appeared dreamlike and each thing that happened in the poem seemed inevitable 
uh, to, in your dreamlike state. And then you wake up from it and you say, who wrote that? I have no idea. You know, it wasn't me. <laughs> it's, uh, I've heard people mention this before, but it's, it's like that idea of, I think it's called flow, that, you know, athletes get into, um, but almost that sort of creative... Uh, subconscious coming to the fore, and um, it, it's great. I was just in a in a workshop, and people were talking about how they don't want to have to explain always why they write something in a poem because sometimes it does feel like it's coming out. It's not something they've again to come back to what John was saying. It hasn't started with an idea and a plan and all come out in the way you could explain how you baked a cake. Uh, let's see. Let's go to another question. Uh, we've got. Janice D. Solderling in Sweden, actually. Uh, I'm glad this our, our uh, listeners and watchers are coming from around the world as well. She asks uh, if you could both say a few words about the role of imagery in your work. Uh, maybe if we could have John first and then Dorian. The role of imagery. Um, the image for me, I, what I, what I what I enjoy about poetry is that it's deceitful, is that it appears to be telling us one thing or showing and it's actually showing us something else. So the image in the poem for me, for instance, the image that a poem starts with is never really what the poem's about. It's only a starting off point and uh, opens up something else for us. So the, the dry dock, for instance, that, uh, that Mybridge photographed is about movement. It's about moving from one medium to another. Um, and I think the imagery for me, um, it, I really like keys and locks. The, the, the images in the poem are opening doors that we can look through and see things that in, in slightly different perspective. And that's what I loved about uh, the moon imagery in Dorian's poem, that, that stunning uh, revelation that she gave us that the moon is six feet further away now than it was when we were children. You know, it, it, it attacks all our preconceptions about the, the way the, the, the universe works. I, I love that. Dorian, do you um, want to say a few words? Yeah. Yeah, um, for me, images are, uh, as John says, um, stepping off points and very important stepping off points for me. Um, I think that if I'd had more money and time, I would have been a, a photographer or a filmmaker. I love uh, creating, recreating images in language. Um, but I think I would have preferred to create the images alone if I could have. Um, but uh, because they're that powerful for me. Um, and yet I don't see them as images as merely scenery. I mean, these images provoke very powerful feelings that are connected to um, myriad stories and, and um, uh, feelings and facts. And so somehow the image allows me to say something that otherwise, again, I could not have said. Um, having not fallen in love with the image. Um, and so sometimes I will, you know, uh, just just write a poem simply because I want to get something that I see down on the page and see it again um, through through my imagination rather than my eyes. And that's the part that begins to make a poem when you start seeing the image through the imagination versus um, through through just purely that visual lens. Thank you so much. It often feels as if uh, images are one of the sort of building blocks of poetry, but it's fabulous to hear everyone talking about the precise way that they might relate to it. We just did a big project here at the library pairing uh, poets with printmakers, and it was really intriguing to see how the printmakers came at image versus how the poets came at image, and often uh, though they came to the images from different places, there was a lot of understanding in the midst of that about what images could do in a lot of the ways you're talking about, about being a, a way of actually 
giving form to our emotions uh, and sorry, our... Can I come back? Oh, sorry, Jennifer. Oh, no, please. I, I'm, I'm just... Uh, uh, one of my favourite examples of using the image, as you say, to talk about emotions um, is in Van Gogh's diaries. The, the, he, there's, there's a letter he writes to his brother Theo and he's basically, he's bitching about how difficult life is and uh, how he, the, the turmoil that's inside him, you can never get that over to, to, to the people in, in, in the world around him. And the only way you can talk about it is to fall into an image. So he, he, he says, you know, um, what can I say? Do, do our inward thoughts ever show outwardly? And then he says, there may be a great fire in our soul but no one comes to warm their hands at it, and the passers-by see only a little bit of smoke coming from the chimney and pass on their way. Oh, so funny. the image is when he falls into the image that suddenly you see exactly, you feel exactly what was going on in his head, that turmoil. Sorry. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful. Did you just have that in your head, or did you have that written down? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got it in my head. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing to have in your head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got a question from China. This is Ryan Adams who asks, uh, I think this is for Dorian, uh, as a poet who looks closely at the world, do you ever feel like migrating to the moon? Uh, seriously though, in your experience writing poetry, have you ever lost hope in humanity? I think poetry is the one place I don't lose hope <laughs> in the humanity in my real life. I, you know, I mean, in, in daily life, you lose hope about, you know, 20 times a day. Um, but poetry is what, you know, is about our humanity and about excavating that, that hope every single time you write a poem. I mean, why else write a poem? Um, I was thinking about um, those images, for instance, uh, John's image of the pearl, um, you know, one sad, small, turbulent world, you know, this very gray world that's commonplace. And yes, he's speaking those words and he's comparing the world to this small, sad, uh, lusterless pearl. Um, but he's also describing it in a way that we cannot help but love it. Um, uh, in the same way he talks about that newborn child looking over the shoulder back toward Bethlehem, which makes us think of Lot's wife, of course, but also maybe looking back to see Yates, you know, uh, rough beast, you know, slouching toward Bethlehem to be born. Um, you know, a single image can contain so much, and you might think that those are sad images or um, hopeless, you know, in some way. But the fact that they are being brought forth uh, makes us love ourselves more. It, it, I, I don't know of any poem that I've read that, that I love that makes me feel hopeless. Um, that for me is, is uh, antithetical in some ways to poetry. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, John, it'd be lovely to know what you think about that, and I, I don't know that this ties in exactly, but uh, we've got a question from uh, our friend, the poet Andrew Phillip, here in Scotland, in Linlithgow, and he says he's fascinated that you say you don't think of yourself as a spiritual person. Why is that? So I wonder if um, there are connections to be drawn between this idea of hope hopefulness in poetry versus the idea of the spiritual in poetry. Yeah, I, I do think of myself as as an unspiritual person, um, although I'm deeply interested in in the things that we can't see of the world. You know that you know since the 1930s, the this idea of dark matter that the vast majority of what there is in the universe, we suppose, is invisible to us, and its existence can only be inferred from the gravitational effects it has on other things. To, to me, that stands as this metaphor for 
the dark matter that we probably have inside us, the, the vast majority of us that we can't see, that we can't understand, but somehow or other has an effect on those around us. And so like Dorian, I, I find the, the poem uh, um, a, hope, a hopeful thing. The, the content and the, the, the meaning of the poem may well be dark, but it draws people together. So when so when Dorian was reading her her first poem, um, Dust, this this idea of us out in the world moving rocks, being so busy moving rocks that we're too tired to turn around and pay attention to God, I immediately um, that resonated with me immediately, and I thought, yes, this is my life too. I can I can absolutely see this. This is why I don't don't see God. I'm too busy moving the rocks of my words around on a page. Um, so. That's it. I do say I'm, I'm not a spiritual person, and yet I can't understand why I'm quite happy to to believe that the universe began with a, a sphere of matter the size of a ba basketball. I mean, it's incredible that it's true. Fantastic. Uh, and we're probably just about coming to the end of our time, but we, we do actually, there's another question here from Andrew that is maybe a lovely one to end on. Uh, and I'll ask both uh, Dorian and John this. Uh, he says, we've just celebrated Burns Night. Happy birthday, Robert Burns. Uh, and if you could ensure that one poem of yours would still be read in 200 years time, which one would it be and why? Who's going to start this one? Um, oh gosh, I don't know. I, I don't even know how to begin. No, I'm glad you said that, Dorian. Yeah. Um, there's a bit of me that has been you, always. You could pick one of each other's. Maybe that's easier. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I, mean, I hope the moon poem's still around in 200 years' time because that one <laughs> really moved me. But. I've always tried to reassure myself that nothing I write will be around in 200 years' time. I can rest <laughs> safe in my grave that it's all been forgotten and that they've moved on to much better things. I, I don't know, honestly. And just to put a slightly different perspective on it, I have to admit here that I've never in my life been to a burn supper. I think and, that you have to leave the country now. <laughs> Well, I'd want to go to a W.S. Graham supper, you know, or a Marion Angus supper. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, when you think of the poems that have lasted, that have come down to us uh, after so many years, um, for instance, that, you know, Rough Beast, um, it, that was imagined so many years ago and for it to still have power today is so amazing to me and I can't even imagine writing something that would have that kind of power that would last that long um, and I don't think that any poet can really think about those things because it might stop that poet from writing um, I think that that uh, when when the poet writes, all there is is the moment in which the poem is being written, and there's no one that it's being written for except the self and some other that's out there, um, floating among the stars somewhere, and um, but there's no those no no real face, no real personality. It's just an entity that we write toward, and that writing toward is wonderful but it has nothing to do with posterity or individuals or groups or cultures or anything it's um, it's just again not what the writing is about um, and and I do think if I thought anything at all about posterity I would stop writing in that very moment you know <laughs> say no I can't do this you know um, it, it that would be an impossible thing to think. Um, Dorian, you, you probably remember this better than me, but was it Stanley Kunitz that, that described the poem as a, as a mechanism for preserving energy? 
I think it was Stanley Kunitz, I love the idea that the poems that persist, the ones that we'll be reading in 200 years time, are the poems that no matter how many times we read them, and how many times we recite them, they never lose one erg of their energy. They're always still there. And there's tiny poems like uh, that Gerald Manley Hopkins on a nun taking up the veil. I, I, I must have recited that out loud to myself hundreds and hundreds of times, and every scrap of the energy is still in it. I think that's an amazing and wonderful place perhaps to to end on because I think most of this whole conversation we've been having has been about the power that poetry has both for readers and for the writers of poetry and that that's why we love it and certainly our mission here at the Scottish Poetry Library is to bring people in poetry together and it feels to me that that power, that um, that infinite power is at the heart of that. So uh, it's been such a joy and a delight to spend this time with both of you and to hear your voices sharing your extraordinary poems. Thank you. And it's, as I mentioned, it's been a real dream come true to be able to reach you both across, across the sea and to cross over these borders, that uh, these physical borders. So. Um, thank you so much to Robert for helping make that possible. Uh, thank you to my friend Lilius, who's one of my colleagues who's been here and working on this whole project with me. So it's been great to have her support. Um, thanks to all the audience out there. Uh, do buy these poets' books. Um, and do come visit us at the Scottish Poetry Library and become a friend of the library and visit our website, www.scottishpoetrylibrary.com. Is it org.uk? <laughs> and um, and uh, thank you so much, most of all, to John Glenday and to Dorian Knox for being so generous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Robert and everyone who helped to make this happen. John, it's just been an absolute pleasure to listen to your poems once again. And um, I, I can't thank you enough for inviting me. And likewise, Dorian, it was such a pleasure hearing you read uh, again, and it was, it's was been a lovely evening, and thanks very much. And Jennifer, um, thank you for being such a great intermediary, and <laughs> back with the launch of your own book with uh, Locust and Madeline, which I think is <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks to all three of you for... Uh, a lovely evening. Um, we're going to be doing this again. Uh, our February reading is coming up um, very soon, in fact. So in uh, just a week and a half, on the 5th of February, um, we'll have another reading hosted by the literary journal Fjords, featuring Christopher Crawford, based in Prague, and Anthony Madrid, based in uh, Chicago. So that's the 5th of February at 8 p.m. in the UK, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, noon Pacific Time, uh, 9 p.m. Western European time. Hope you can join us then. Again, just a huge thanks to the poets and a reminder to seek them out. People have been uh, talking on social media about um, how much they enjoyed the evening and how they're going to seek out your, your books and, and learn more if they don't already know uh, of you. And a um, reminder to you know look for their books online, uh, go to your favorite local independent bookshop and, and request them. Um, and we'll see you back here uh, again in, in a week and a half's time on the 5th of February. See you then. <laughs>